Welcome to Mission Daily. On today's episode, Chad and Ian sit down with Karthik Rao, founder and CEO of Signal FX, a monitoring solution for cloud applications and infrastructure that delivers real-time insights. Signal FX's customer list includes hundreds of brands in an array of industry verticals, from e-commerce to technology to enterprise and more. Karthik recently helped lead SignalFX into its Series E, which will allow for more product development and global expansion. Prior to founding SignalFX, Karthik held leadership positions as Vice President of Product Management and Worldwide Marketing at VMware, and more recently as Vice President of Products and Engineering at Delphix. On today's episode, Ian and Chad sit down with Karthik and Thomas Buda, CMO of SignalFX, to discuss the beginnings of the company the culture of tech during the dot-com boom and bust, and how SignalFX plans to expand into the future. Welcome, Karthik. Welcome, Thomas. And Ian, nice to see you. How's everybody doing? Doing great. Thanks, Chad. I'm excited to have you here. Uh, This is, I guess, an impromptu roundtable. And uh, yeah, so let's kick it off. Let's go around the table and just uh, introduce everyone quickly. Um, Karthik, when people ask who you are, what are you doing? What are you up to right now? How do you respond? I'm Karthik Rao. I'm the co-founder and CEO of SignalFX. We're a cloud monitoring solution built for developers of modern distributed applications. And Thomas? Uh, I have the pleasure of working with Karthik. I'm chief marketing officer of SignalFX. And a two-time guest on Marketing Trends? That's right. Yeah. Awesome. And speak of the devil, Ian. Hey, what's going on, everyone? We're just going to sit here uh, co-pilot on this. We wanted to, couldn't pass up the opportunity to hear some pearls of wisdom here from, from Karthik. So Karthik, we were talking before we started recording and you're a Silicon Valley veteran in every sense of the word. Uh, how'd you get started and what were the origins of your career here? Uh, well, I went to college here in the Bay Area at Stanford uh, during the dot-com craze. So it was uh, hard not to be infected by the uh, enthusiasm and the energy here. Uh, I ended up joining uh, Silicon Valley um, full-time at a company called LoudCloud uh, back in 2000. I knew some people uh, who had joined the company and um, it was co-founded by uh, Mark Andreessen, who still is legendary in, in the Valley for what he's done um, and uh, got a front seat to the dot-com bust <laughs> from the very, you know, I, I think I joined those telling you, I joined the company just at the very pinnacle of the dot-com boom in right. March of 2000. Um, and that was quite an experience, but, uh, yeah, I've, I've been, I've been here for almost uh, 20 years now in Silicon Valley. So I'm curious, I was not here during the dot com boom and bust. I've heard a lot of secondhand stories. I would love to hear some firsthand stories of what it was like then. And because people were in the media kind of claiming it was like the nuclear winter techs never coming back. Um, could you maybe talk about some of the craziness leading up to the crash and then after the crash? Yeah, it was it was pretty crazy. I mean, it was uh, I remember I, I can speak to my experience at uh, LoudCloud. Uh, I think Ben and Mark had started the company in September of 1999. Uh, I interviewed with them in January of 2000. Uh, and at that time, the company was about 50 people. Um, by the time I joined in March, of 2000, it was about 125 people. And six months later, it was almost 600 people. So wow. in the span of a year, they grew the team to about 600 people. Uh, now, not every company was growing at that clip, but it was fairly representative of what was going on uh, in the dot-com days. And, you know, the interesting thing is a lot of the ideas were actually great ideas. They were just 10 years ahead of their time. It's just the market right. wasn't big enough and the technology didn't really exist to support the vision that all of those companies had. But um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was just some crazy time. So just a lot of growth and, and the business models just, uh, didn't support that kind of growth at, at that time. And what was your role at, uh, LoudCloud when you joined? And then what was it when you left the company? Uh, well, LoudCloud, I joined on the product management team. Um, and, uh, you know, LoudCloud was in many ways a predecessor to what all the cloud computing companies are doing today, like Amazon with Amazon web services and Google cloud computing. The idea was that, uh, cloud computing should be utility, just like electricity uh, has been for a long time. Um, the challenge was that just the technologies didn't exist to do it cost effectively, and the market was you know a fraction of the size it is today. Um, but I joined on the product management team. I was responsible actually for the monitoring uh, systems that uh, LoudCloud was building uh, for its customers. Um, and uh, spent uh, a good uh, you know two and a half years or so there on the product management side of the house uh, as an individual contributor. 
Uh, and then as Loud Cloud ended up um, meeting its demise and ended up having to uh, repurpose itself and Ben uh, Horowitz did a remarkable job turning around that company, um, pivoting it into a, a enterprise software company while it was a, effectively a, a public company. And, uh, you know, that was a very, very difficult transition. Um, around that time, um, the person who had hired me into uh, Loud Cloud had joined VMware and recruited me into VMware. And so I made the switch uh, mid-2002 to, to go over to VMware and spend a good um, seven years there at VMware. So real-time monitoring back in those days, what was it like and what was the state of that uh, tech back then? It wasn't very real-time. Right. I mean, the, the <laughs> applications were fundamentally different, right? I mean, you think back, people were, were running uh, primarily Unix workloads on big, beefy uh, proprietary machines, you know, Solaris, Sun Solaris machines, uh, HPUX machines, and they were big, um, you know, big beefy machines and monolithic. And generally the state of the art back then was, you know, you would collect uh, metrics every five minutes. Um, and, you know, that that was basically state of the art back then. So That's it wasn't cool. very real time at all. Every five minutes. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. And at VMware, what was uh, your role there and what was uh, going on at the time when you joined? Yeah, VMware was the most important company that no one knew about um, back in 2002. Um, the founders had you know, started the company back in 1998. And um, the idea was, which, which was not, you know, it was a bit of a controversial idea at the time, was that the world would move to general purpose hardware systems. You know, back in the late 90s, you would have one operating system running on one class of hardware. So you'd have Solaris on Spark. You would have uh, AIX on the sort of on the IBM machines. You would have uh, Windows on Intel. Uh, Linux was still in in many people's eyes just a toy. It wasn't really being run in production workloads. And so you have this pattern of you know one operating system type running on one type of hardware. And VMware had this uh, vision that um, x86 would become the de facto uh, hardware platform that everyone would use and there would be multiple operating systems that you know people would would run on this general purpose hardware platform and um you know the concepts around um, having this virtualized hardware that could support all of these heterogeneous operating systems was the concept behind vmware and you know back when uh, diane and mendel um, got the company started everyone's like this is just a niche solution because everyone's just running windows on on x86 what's the value proposition here but um, what it had, you know, what was happening was that Linux was becoming very much a mainstream operating system, uh, very much going into production workloads. And you had organizations that were running Linux workloads, Windows workloads, uh, you know, multiple of these workloads. And they were, if they had to run each of these dedicated on a specific piece of hardware, they were just massively underutilizing their entire infrastructure. Um, the other thing that was happening is everyone had a champagne hangover from the dot-com like days. So everyone was building out all this infrastructure and then, you know, all the demand kind of dissipated and they were stuck with all of this infrastructure running these, you know, individual uh, workloads. And so all of that kind of created the environment where a VMware could come in and provide this, this new layer of abstraction that would become the foundation for what is now, you know, cloud computing. Companies like AWS and GCP and and uh, Microsoft Azure, you know, those those sorts of solutions couldn't exist without a virtualization layer like what VMware had had created. Um, but at the time, it was still in its infancy. So when I joined the company in 2002, you know, the VMware had a desktop business where they were selling a desktop product to, um, you know technical professionals, mostly QA testers who would run multiple uh, operating systems on their desktops so that they could test different uh, platforms. And that was doing about $30 million a year in revenue. Uh, but the server business, which is what VMware is, is really known for today, was only about a million dollars a quarter. Uh, and so about a $4 million a year business. Uh, so that's when I joined the company. And uh, we had, I think about a year before that, introduced um, the bare metal uh, ESX server uh, offering and uh, it was just beginning to get its momentum. Um, Diane had just inked a partnership agreement with IBM, which is really what you know set the company forward. Uh, one of the best, in my opinion, one of the best partnerships ever created, and what really launched uh, VMware to become the company that it eventually became. Uh, and so that was really when everything started to click, and and the business just kind of went up and to the right. So I joined on the product side uh, to focus on all of the management products, Diane uh, and team had the vision that, you know, they had this phenomenal platform, but 
um, there would be significantly more value unlocked if if they could build a management layer on top of it. So that was what I was tasked with. And Diane Green started that company based on research that she was doing at Stanford, or what were the origins of that again? Well, so Mendel Rosenblum and uh, a number of his PhD students had been oh, working right. on this at Stanford. Um, you know, basically taking some of the concepts that people had been doing in the mainframe. Uh, where you know you could have virtual machines running on the mainframe and and applying that to the world of uh, commodity distributed uh, x86 systems and so they'd been doing this research at Stanford and uh, you know as they'd been working on it thought that there could be an opportunity to build a company around it and that's how the company got started and Diane was coming off of uh, a different experience she had sold a company and uh, was ready to do the next thing and uh, join them to run the company sure and you mentioned partnerships there uh, our audience is filled with a lot of different execs and founders and investors and things like that. Uh, I'd be curious to know what made that partnership between VMware and IBM so great, and uh, how did that, you know, maybe develop your thoughts on partnerships? Well, I think the the key thing, you know, everyone it's it's cliche. Everyone likes to talk about win win partnerships, but um, what ended up happening there was, you know, VMware was a small company. People and we were running on the hardware directly with this this ESX. Uh, uh, server uh, solution and um, for someone to to run something underneath the operating systems that they were comfortable running where they had all of these certifications and you know from all of the different labs that you know hey we you know you can attach an EMC array to this Windows server or this uh, Unix server and um, you know you can get support if if you have a problem with your machine you know you can call us up and we'll support 100% of the time when you insert this unknown layer which no one has heard about from VMware in between it's a it can be a fairly risky thing for the customer to do um, and the other so there was some you know hesitation technically of you know should we buy this from VMware not knowing if all of the rest of our vendors will support us if we have an issue if we're running on VMware virtual hardware basically uh, and then the other problem was VMware just wasn't very well known um, you know it still was a relatively small company and building distribution or to get into all of these big companies was something that we just didn't have um, the challenge that IBM had it was really fascinating because IBM you think of as you know their history in the hardware was building these big mainframe systems right and they were really good at building um, these highly available reliable big mainframe systems and the world had moved beyond that right they moved to these small distributed systems smaller x86 servers and um it, it people didn't care as much about reliability and and they were running these cheap workloads at the time they're mostly tier two and tier three workloads on all of their x86 systems and so i what ibm had done is they had this this server line which was built on x86 but there were these big beefy machines there were eight cpus they had a ton of memory uh, they were super resilient, highly available, um, you know, fantastically designed systems, but there were no workloads that people were really willing to run on them because most of the Windows workloads at the time were, you know, you'd run them on one CPU, two CPUs, um, and they were, again, tier two and tier three workloads. So it didn't, you know, they didn't care about the reliability and availability as much. And so IBM was having a difficult time selling those systems, but that's what they knew. They were really good at building those systems. Um, and so interestingly enough, they saw VMware and it reminded them of the mainframe, right? Because they they built the virtualization software for mainframe systems. And um, the reason that partnership was so good was they were able to then say, well, if you put VMware on top of our systems, now this this looks like a mini mainframe, but it's running on x86. And instead of finding that you know one in a million big beefy workload that could run on eight CPUs, you can just run 20 or 30 of your small workloads just combine them and, and run them on, you know, enterprise grade, highly available, highly resilient IBM hardware. And now instead of spending on, you know, 20 or 30 Dell machines, you can just buy one big reliable IBM machine and run 20 small workloads in VMs on, on our mini mainframe. And that was the way that they were able to go and differentiate against HP and Dell and sell a premium solution. And it was kind of the missing piece that allowed them to really differentiate their offering. And so it gave them true differentiation. Uh, and as a part of that, they were willing to OEM uh, VMware. They were willing to support it. So if the customer, an enterprise customer, had an issue uh, getting support, they could call IBM and IBM would support them. Oh, wow. And so it worked for us because we had, um, you know, we got the things that we needed. They got the things that they needed. And they brought their their might uh, to selling the solution. And that's when things really just started to take off. Sure. Uh, and Diane was always really good about 
um, thinking about the partner first. Uh, and the challenge we had was, you know, a lot of people were uh, wary of these sorts of partnerships because Microsoft had, uh, you know, the way they'd partner with everyone, they uh, ended up taking all of the spoils in the market. Sure. And so people were a little bit wary of that, but we were uh, pretty good in how we treated the partners to make sure that they got sufficient economics out of it as well. Yeah. Very cool to hear. Uh, let's take a step back for a moment. I'd love to hear more about what was going on culturally at the time, because tech wasn't necessarily the coolest industry to be in at that time. Uh, so I'd be curious to know, uh, Thomas, what you know, what were you up to at the time? Were you working in advertising and from the, or were you in tech at the time? I was at Red Hat. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Cool. So I had just joined Red Hat uh, in 1999 as their first CMO pre IPO. So you kind of caught like a little bit, you know, before the, the aftermath and the fallout. I saw both ends of it. It was, yeah, we were at one point after we did a, our IPO and then a secondary offering, we were worth, we had raised about $500 million. Um, we were worth, um, in the stock market, uh, measures of things about $20 billion on about $50 million in revenue. Wow. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was nuts, but I tell you the one, just one quick, um, point to make uh, relative to your, your uh, conversation about partnerships. So one of the big successes that we had at, at Red Hat was actually understanding that there was no way that we can create the kind of distribution um, or market leverage uh, or even market acceptance uh, on our own mm -hmm. um, relative to the, well, Microsoft, who we were effectively competing with. And so the first company that we went after was Intel and um, Intel actually made a strategic investment but having Intel, which was really part of the Wintel duopoly at the time, um, become a partner and an investor in Red Hat sent massive signals to the market. And then from there, that was like the kingpin. Mm -hmm. And then we knocked off you know, IBM, uh, we knocked off Dell for distribution and then Sun and then Oracle and we got Oracle workloads to get ported onto Red Hat Linux. Um, so it created an extraordinary leverage uh, for the company as a result. I wanted to ask a kind of signal specific question, but sure. I don't know if you're ready to go there yet. I'm ready. All Let's right. do it. Well, it's so interesting hearing that whole story. And I'd love to hear just kind of your side of the, of the origin signal effects. But what's so interesting to hear all of that, what you were saying is, you know, how the, I don't want to say, you know, times were simpler back then, but like you compare that to now where someone has hybrid cloud, they have the younger companies can go, you know, cloud native the entire way. You have companies with like massive amounts of, you know, on-prem legacy stuff. Like, wasn't it, it seems like a company today has so many more options, so much more confusion and so much more need for something like what SignalFX is doing. Whereas back then it's like the level of complexity that one of these companies just wouldn't have. Yes, I, I would agree with that sentiment. I think what's what's really changed is the market for software-based services has increased exponentially yeah. in the past 15 years, right? I mean, in 2001, you had a few hundred million people connected to the internet, and they were connected when they were sitting in front of their desktops. Today, you've got, I think, 4 billion people connected to the internet, and they're connected all the time with their smartphones, yeah. right? So in terms of minutes of consumption, it's up through the roof. So what that means is that software has just become a far more significant part of everyone's day-to-day -day lives. And as a result, there's just a, a lot more money going into it. There's a lot more attention to the sorts of technologies that need to support it. Uh, and I think that's overall been great for our, for our industry, right? I mean, there's just, like you're saying, it's just so much easier today if you're an entrepreneur starting out with a new company or new idea to run on a cloud service provider and, you know, leverage a ton of open source technologies to get, you know, get going. But with that speed and flexibility comes complexity, right? So you can't have it both ways. You can't say, you know, we want to have a ton of flexibility and a bunch of choice and opportunities to get stuff going in a jiffy, but then also have it, you know, have absolutely no complexity. It's, it's, we've optimized for speed and that's why we're seeing a lot of the, the challenges present themselves as, as they have been. Um, and that was a part of our thesis when we started SignalFX um, six and a half years ago was that, you know, we felt that because of this massive investment in software, you know, the world is changing and, and two fundamental things would change. One, the way that people architect their software and their systems would, would fundamentally change. And so people used to run in, uh, you know, these big monolithic applications in 
physical data centers with proprietary hardware. That's changing because now everyone's optimizing for speed and getting stuff out quickly. Um, they're going to be running in these smaller, more distributed applications, you know, microservices, containerized. They would be running in software-defined cloud infrastructure. And so that was one major shift that was happening. The other shift, which we actually think is even more significant, is how people build and operate software would be fundamentally different, yeah. not just how they design it. So it used to be, you know, you would do one or two big software releases a year, throw it over the fence for someone else to manage. And that worked in the days of packaged software. But in today's world, everything is delivered as a service. So you have a mobile app, it's connected to a cloud service. You know, you're very rarely downloading actual, you know, packaged software into your into your laptop. You're connecting to a web browser and everything is as a service. Cars are connected to web services now. Um, and so in that world, whoever builds the software, whichever organization is building the software, has a responsibility for operating it. So you're operating your own software. And in that world, how developers think about software is fundamentally different because now they have to start thinking about operations. And that's given rise to the whole DevOps movement, DevOps, right? Yeah. So those were two fundamental shifts that we saw coming. Uh, and they were really they really good shifts for the industry because it, again, would enable people to build software more quickly. It would lower the bar for you know what what it takes to be able to release a new application. But like anything, it comes with its own set of complexities and people have to rethink how they're going to operate, how they're going to manage these new applications. And that was the opportunity that we latched onto when we started SignalFX. And we thought we would focus on one really big part of that problem, which is, you know, how do you monitor your software in a world where, you know, you could be updating it every day yep. and you could be updating it across, you know, dozens or hundreds of microservices across dozens or hundreds of teams. Um, that's a far more complex problem than, you know, what we had to deal with at, at LoudCloud when we were, you know, upgrading an Oracle database, you know, once a quarter. Well, and, and I want to go back to the thing that you said earlier, which is, you know, you'd get an update every five minutes, right? The difference is now you have a retailer that wants to do a flash sale for five minutes, right? So if you're not updating in real time for those, all of those five minutes, like you're talking about, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars that are lost. And as a company, there's no, to the consumer, they don't know any of this is going on, right? So it's like, what they expect is that if, you know, blank company has a flash sale, that I'm going to be able to buy my shoes. Yeah. And and the world has changed. You're right. Back, back then, 20 years ago, if it was a back office application that's down, yeah, your worker productivity might be impacted for a little bit, but they get over it, right? Or if it's, you know, the the amount of business that was actually going through online channels or the amount of your brand that was dependent on your digital channels was so much lower back then, right? If your online store was down for a little bit, you still had 99% of your business going through physical retail channels. But in today's world, your digital brand is your brand, so you can't afford to be down at all. And so the requirements have fundamentally changed. Um, and you know, therefore, people need to pay a lot more attention to this kind of stuff than they did 20 years ago. I love that your digital brand is your brand. Can't <laughs> afford to go down. When you first started SignalFX, what was the specific problem that you were like laser focused on and how has that evolved over the years? Um, I, I don't know if it was real time monitoring from the beginning or what was that genesis like? Well, the origin stories of our company are that our technical team uh, had come out of Facebook. Um, so our CTO, who you've, you've had on, Arjit uh, Mukherjee and Rajesh Raman, our chief architect, and several of our early engineers were all at Facebook in the late 2000s and were responsible for building the monitoring systems at Facebook. Uh, and so the way they'd done it at Facebook was they'd basically turned um, monitoring into an analytics problem. Uh, you know, they were famous for their uh, move fast and break things culture, right? Sure. Which today everyone calls DevOps. Uh, but an intern could show up on the first day of work and push code out into Facebook. Uh, so in that kind of an environment, what they realized was you, you know, there are two ways of solving this problem, right, of, of monitoring. One is you can put a ton of controls over everything and make sure every single change is reviewed 10 times over and you've got a small army kind of ready to catch some, you know, uh, review all of the release, put all of the, the checks in place. But that is the enemy of innovation, right? You're not going to move quickly if you've got all of those checks in place. And so what Facebook did was instead of optimizing for making sure you never make a mistake, they optimized for how do we catch a mistake as quickly as possible and how do we design our system so we can roll it back as quickly as possible and not affect our users. And when they did it that way, then they had a lot more confidence to push change out very quickly because they knew, hey, we have the systems. If we do something stupid, um, then we can catch it immediately and we can roll it back very quickly. And the way they did that was by having the monitoring systems in place 
that uh, collected data about everything, right? Data about the infrastructure, about the applications, about user interactions with their applications. And they were monitoring that very, very, very closely. Every single time they did a code push, uh, they could detect very quickly, did something go wrong? And then they could initiate whatever rollback procedures that they had. Uh, and so monitoring really became a core part of every developer's day-to-day life. And uh, not just monitoring, but they started to build a lot of analysis around the monitoring data to help really identify, you know, if they had a problem and to identify that very quickly. So that was very different from the way most people had done monitoring, which is, you know, alert if there's a problem, right? If a disk fails or something, alert me. But it there wasn't as much tell me about what's changed or what's different so that I can maybe catch something before it starts to impact users or help me isolate issues across like a broader uh, complex environment so I can get someone to focus on the right thing as quickly as possible. Uh, and so that was what they had done at Facebook. And, you know, when we started the company, you know, the rest of the world hadn't really caught up to that. They were still mostly dealing with, you know, traditional enterprise workloads running on big monolithic systems. Cloud was still in its infancy. I think Amazon Web Services eclipsed a billion dollars in sales for the first time in 2012, you know, just when we were starting our company. And Docker hadn't even launched yet, so people wow. weren't really doing containers and microservices. But we foresaw that trend, and we thought, okay, well, if the rest of the world starts to behave and act more like a Facebook or a Google, um, they're going to need a better way of monitoring these applications. It's going to need to be more real-time. It's going to need to um, leverage a more sophisticated analytics engine. You know, The challenges are just going to be completely different uh, from the kinds of challenges traditional monitoring systems had to solve. So. That was the impetus for us to start the company sure. and you know why we decided to put all our efforts behind SignalFX. And I'm really curious too, how has your view on the total addressable market for SignalFX changed since the founding days? Because obviously software is eating the world with the proliferation of SaaS services, the market's growing as you grow. Uh, so what are your thoughts on that? Well, we've always thought it was a huge market. I think uh, what what's happened in the last six years is we just have even more conviction that uh, the timing of it is what we had expected it to be. Because timing is always a hard thing to get right. right? Sure. Like at LoudCloud, we had conviction about what we were doing, but we were probably six or seven years too early, right? AWS started in 2006, I think six or seven years after LoudCloud started, and that was the right time to start a cloud computing business. Um, and so for us, the question was always, when when will this happen, not if? Um, you know, would it, when would it happen in a couple of years after we started the company, in which case we just wouldn't have had enough time to build out the product and distribution to take advantage of it? Would it take 10 years? Then, you know, we'd starve as a young company if it took 10 years. So the Goldilocks zone for us was, you know, if the market really starts to take off and have real momentum in four to six years, that would be perfect. And that's kind of how it unfolded, you know, in uh we started the company officially early 2013, and we started to see real momentum towards cloud in 2015, 2016. And now it's it's inevitable. Everyone is is moving to cloud, moving to these newer architectures. Um, so the timing has been really great. So as a CEO, too, I'd be curious to get your take on uh, how do you view the role of a CEO in a highly technical company like this? Do you think it's a, a normal type of CEO job or uh, what are your thoughts and approach to leadership? Well, I think there's no one size fits all. Every leader is unique. Every company is unique. And there's, you know, it, ju- it just depends on the individuals and the circumstances. Um, I think there's a, a different kind of grit and I think background and, and mentality needed when you're getting something started, mm-hmm. you know, from zero to to one in Peter Thiel's vocabulary, right? When sure. you're just getting going. Uh, and you really have to formulate the market. You have to, it's just, it's a different kind of mentality. And there, it's very helpful to have, I think, it's very helpful to have a technical background and especially in emerging technologies uh, to be able to navigate the landscape and kind of set some clear strategy for the the team, the product team, the engineering team. But then, you know, as you start to grow and, and get, you know, when you feel like you've got the right product for the market, then a lot of the challenges start to become distribution, right? How do you go to market? What are the, right kinds of partnerships you want to create? Um, you know, are you a bottoms up kind of a sales motion? Are you a, a more of an enterprisey sales motion in, in sort of B2B types of businesses like ours? Um, so then a lot of those start to become more go to market related. Um, and, but they're both equal, you know, at least in the early stages, you have to, you have to have a handle on both, um, very, very, very closely. And then 
you know, I, I don't know what it's like to be a CEO of a much bigger company, um, but I'd imagine, you know, I, what I've observed is that my role keeps changing every 18 to 24 months uh, as the company gets from one stage to the next. Any tips on letting go of your old job to embrace the new one? Um, <laughs> well, it's it's helpful if you've got a really great uh, exec staff around you that remind you of uh, how the world is changing and where they need your help. Because I think it's, uh, you know, when you're a young company, for example, I, I remember I had, I was knee deep on details on everything because I had to be, and I, I didn't have, um, the resources and we didn't have the momentum to, to have the kinds of executives that we have today, you know, when we were two years old. And so I necessarily had to get involved in all the details, but, you know, now I, we've got a great executive team and, uh, you know, my role really is to make sure that they have enough context into what we're trying to accomplish as a business and make sure that information flow is, is, is that information is flowing, that context is flowing, that people understand priorities very well, um, that we're getting the resources we need to invest in the right parts of the business. And then, um, the stuff that I used to do on a day-to-day basis, I can now do with far less time because I have leverage through my executive right. team. And so, you know, I can't say I was uh, perfect at recognizing that shift. It's uh, you, you kind of learn as you go, but, um, and it's a constant uh, learning for sure. Yeah. I wanted to to ask about the exec team as well. Obviously, you know, we've had a chance to talk to, uh, to talk to Tom, chance to talk to, to Mark, your COO and, uh, and Arjun and Rajesh, your technical side has all been around since super early days, but your go-to-market team you've built over the last two years. And I'm really curious to see, like, you have such a strong culture. Every single person that we've talked to on the team is rowing in the same direction. And it's like really clear that that's the case. Um, Mark joked that he uh, he was only going to be at uh, at Andrews Norwitz for for six months. Uh, and, you know, whatever, six, six years later, and you finally uh, pried him away. But I'm curious, like, how do you kind of get that go to market team built around you know, the product team that's kind of been there for so long. Because I think a lot of companies really struggle with sales, marketing, you know, revenue generation, like versus product. And it seems like there's a lot of collaboration at SignalFX. It was a difficult transition in the early days, I'll tell you, like, uh, because the company was used to, that was a big transition for us as a company because we were largely an engineering company until I hired Mark and we started to really build up our go-to-market uh, I mean, we had sales, we had marketing, but uh, the vast majority of the organization were engineers or technical people. And, you know, I'm I'm a big believer that, you know, you have microcultures and different decision making styles within uh, your your company. How sales and marketing operates is different from how R&D operates. Um, but when we first started building up sales and marketing, there was some I wouldn't say resistance, but just uh, like, whoa, what's what's good? This is different. You know, it's different kind of style, different people coming in and, you know, like what's, it it just felt different. Um, And that was an important transition to manage. I think for me, it was very important to be as transparent as possible with the team. Um, I really believe that, you know, what I'm really proud of the team is that we've got a very uh, entrepreneurial culture and people are problem solvers. And so you don't um, hide the bad things from people. You talk about what's what's going well, but you also embrace the the difficulties, the challenges, and you make sure everyone understands those. And um, I think if if you do that, then hopefully that the team has a little bit more faith and confidence and trust in you that you're doing the right things to to solve those sorts of problems. And so for us, you know, we had a great product. Uh, we felt we had some phenomenal customers, but what we really needed to do was build up distribution and. It was a transition, Um, but I think what was important was we got some early wins. You know, Mark came on board. He brought on some great people. We we started to sign up a bunch of great uh, logos in a really meaningful way, and then people started to see the impact that that was having on the business, and they embraced it and they adapted. Um, But it was a transition period for sure. We joke about uh, the three D's of podcasting: is distribution, distribution, distribution. (laughs) It's the same sort of thing, though, right? It's like. Kind of like, is anyone hearing how happy our customers are? Like, is anyone like, I, I swear they're talking about this stuff, but like, how do we amplify that? And it's interesting to hear that those kind of early struggles. Did you have any early employees that kind of like fought the fought the sizing, like fought the growth a little bit? I don't think anyone fought the growth. I think the biggest I, difference for us, I would say, is, you know, when you're largely uh, an engineering team, you focus a lot on the long term, right? Engineering organizations, R&D organizations, by their very nature, are more long term oriented, right? Where, where is the world going to be in two years? And 
or, or longer in some cases. And how do we give ourselves enough time to build the right elegant solution so we can be where we want to be in a year or two years? Sales or marketing organizations are on 90 day cycles, yep. right? It's like you've got your quarter, you want to hit your quarter. And uh, particularly when you're in an enterprise business, you will have large customers who will sway some of your your direction in, in terms of what you want to do. And so that was the fundamental um, kind of challenge and trade off that we had. It wasn't so much like, no, we don't want to we don't want to grow, but it's, you know, how do we handle this this new aspect of our business where we've got this great enterprise um, go to market organization and they're sending up great logos, but it's coming with a different set of pressures that we're not used to dealing with. And then how do you manage that trade off? And so that was really the, the bulk of the transition that we had to make. But we also started to put on a lot more discipline and structure in our engineering organization. Up until that time, we had been um, mostly driven in engineering by architect types. And yeah. this makes sense when you're a young company, you've got um, a very bottoms up engineering culture and you've got a bunch of really great senior uh, you know, architect types who are thinking very strategically about where you want the product and architecture to go. And you don't want to over-engineer process when you're a young company. And so the, it's perfectly fine. But then once you start getting all of this coming in from the field organization, then you have to have pro some process and some structure or you're going to drown in your own success. So what we had to do at that point was start building in some more structure in how we do engineering so that we can accommodate um, the inbound requests and give our enterprise customers visibility into some of the things that they wanted and when they're going to be delivered, but still protect and and have enough time to focus on the things that we needed to invest in, in, in engineering. And that was in large part the transition that we had to make when we became a multifunctional type of a company. And I'd, I'd say it probably took us a, a, a good you know year or so to get there, year and a half to, to make that transition. And now we've got, you know, we've got a phenomenal EVP of engineering who's come in and, and really put the necessary amount of process on top of engineering without stifling what they really want to be able to do to move our, our product vision forward. Um, and so that that was really more of the, the the tension. It wasn't, you know, I don't think anyone in the company ever, they, they all want the company to do phenomenally well and want us to grow as quickly as we can. It's just a question of how do you do that the right way. When you're thinking about, you know, marketing or use cases or customer success stories, um, are there any favorites you like to share? And Thomas, feel free to chime in yeah, as well. Yeah, we, we've got uh, some phenomenal customers. I, I think the uh, the one story that I love to tell, it's a leading apparel manufacturer and uh, um, the use case there, uh, very similar, Ian, to the, the flash sale example that you brought up, but they've got limited edition uh, launches, flash sales effectively, where they'll sell out their inventory in minutes, sometimes in seconds. Uh, and they're spinning up a bunch of capacity to support these launches. And, um, you know, they were before using signal effects, they were basically flying blind. Um, you know, they would do the launch and, um, you know, hope that everything went well. And oftentimes it didn't, and they'd have all sorts of issues they need to deal with. Uh, but then afterwards they could go and look at all of the, you know, the, the data and do postmortems and figure out what happened and then, uh, try to fix them and hope that it would go well the next time around. But they're really blind during the, uh, the events. And this is true for a lot of our other customers in media, for example, when they've got uh, live streaming events, the same sort of thing, they'll get a burst of traffic and, you know, they don't want to go down during that period. Um, and so what this particular apparel manufacturer did was they start to send all their data to signal effects. And what's unique about us because of our streaming architecture, we can detect patterns within seconds. Um, and so by sending their data to signal effects, they were very quickly able to identify things that were working well, things that were unusual. Uh, and what they started to do was automate some of the responses. Um, and this is, I think, really the nirvana state that most organizations want to get to is have a closed loop process where you've got real time signals coming in, identifying things that are unusual or different, and then being able to automate responses you know, auto scaling, changing a load balancing configuration so that you're not routing traffic to a, you know, a canary deployment, you know, all of those sorts of things you can automate more and more. And so they've started to do that. And as a result, you know, they've gone from having to have two war rooms full of people every single time they do one of these flash sales to having a couple of people who are on call and then having more and more automation. That's a, I think a great success story of, you know, pulling us into a mission critical type of a workload and getting real time visibility. Well, and I think it, this is like a perfect example of how technology shapes culture, because if you're part of the team that's responsible for doing these flash sales, for example, and they always have a bunch of problems, 
you're not going to want to do them. Like that's not going to be an exciting thing to be like, oh, you, you know, can only do so many war rooms before you get burnt out and yeah. your spouse gets uh, very upset. Yeah, no, he said, no, it's exactly right. Uh, and it affects like, um, or like, babe, we're doing another one of these, you know, flash sales. Like, like, gosh, it's going to be a long week. Like, that's just the polar opposite of like, hey, this, these things, you know, make our companies millions of dollars and are cool for our fans and all that sort of stuff. You take that to, hey, we know what's going on. We can see what's, what the problem is like. That's the type of kind of magic elixir that I think a lot of people are looking for. You know, it makes me think of um, like the Shark Tank, how how every single, uh, I don't like watch Shark Tank all the time, but it's always funny to me how they always sell out of their product. The website goes down as soon as they're, you know, on Shark Tank. Mark, if you're listening, Mark Cuban, we're, uh, we're standing by. But I think it's one of those things, like what a classic example of how technology can shape behavior and and make your employees employees happier more productive and you know help them do more with less like that's the purpose of technology yeah exactly so uh thomas any favorite uh customer stories or you know what are you hearing from uh prospects and customers now our expectations for uh immediate satisfaction on any of these digital services that we engage with is the norm and as a result if you're not able to get that if a company can't fulfill that you're going to be disappointed In some cases, those services are actually providing hugely valuable information at the time you need it. And if you're not able to get it, you're not only disappointed, you're actually upset. And it's easy to go on social media, right, and promote that. So the experience that people have actually defines how they feel about a brand. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about who is able to monitor the performance of those services in real time to enable companies to have visibility, into the performance so they can actually do something about it before it affects their customers, that becomes hugely valuable. And so I just see that, you know, as a consumer, um, but also as, as I observe our customers. So Karthik, when you are building the business, how are you thinking about building culture? It's clear that you are. Uh, I'd be curious to know, are there any cultural values your team has? Um, what are your thoughts there? I think culture it has to be deliberate. I think it's first and foremost are reflected by the people that you have, the leadership and the kinds of decisions that they make on a day-to-day basis. It's not, you know, values you put up on a wall. Um, and so it, it starts with me. It, uh, you know, it, it goes to my, my leadership team. And I, I think there are lots of actions that reflect what you value in a culture, um, who gets promoted, uh, who gets put into management positions. I think that's probably the biggest, most important sign of what you value in a culture uh, because that um, indicates to the rest of the organization these are the the values that we appreciate as an organization and are going to reward, right? So that is a telltale sign of, you know, what what what's important in an organization. Um, how you deal with um, disappointment um, and how you treat information flow and individuals uh, in situations where you make mistakes or failures, I think reflects very clearly, um, you know, what you value. And, and, and so I think that those are, you know, two examples of, of actions that speak a lot louder than words. Um, and, uh, and then there are millions of micro decisions that, uh, people look to their leadership and how do you react when you have a trade off between, you got to do something right for a customer versus right for your financials uh, and investors. And, you know, how do you make that trade off? And uh, the more consistency there is in, in how people make those decisions uh, from the CEO to the CRO to the CMO to the EVP of engineering, I think the more consistency you can have on that, then, um, you know, you, you create that kind of a consistent uh, culture. So that that's how I think about it. It's just making sure that decisions um, that I set a good example and that uh, as people are making decisions, we're just very conscious of the kinds of precedents that it, it sets and and trying to drive consistency on some of the things that are important, right? Like um, customers, we care about, we're here to serve our customers. And so if there's ever any question of, you know, do we optimize for a customer or do we optimize for financials? You know, like we have to do the right thing for the customer. Um, and if that means that, you know, it's going to be a little bit more expensive for us and so be it. But, you know, those sorts of things, the more you can make clear and that those sorts of actions get repeated, then that manifests itself throughout the organization. Um, so to me, it's all about, you know, how you act in sorts of critical decision making points. Wise words. Uh, let's shift gears a little bit and do a lightning round to round out the episode. So this is where we 
love to get guest uh, feedback on the books you're reading, the music you're listening to, any great podcasts. Um, but we just want to hear what's your information routine like. So have you read anything great lately? Uh, if so, what is it? I just read The Sixth Extinction, which is a little bit of a scary <laughs> book uh, all about uh, the different extinctions in the history of uh, the earth and uh, some of the trends that obviously we're seeing now with climate change. Um, it's it's a fun read. Good. I mean, I wouldn't say fun, but it's a fast read, sure. but uh, an informative read. Uh, so that's that's what I'm, I just finished. Very cool. Thomas, anything on your radar or anything you've read recently come to mind? I read Conspiracy. Um, this, oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah we're yeah. talking about that the first uh, first time you came. Yeah, yeah, that was like fascinating about um, having a a goal and being willing to commit to that. Ten yeah. years, right? Yeah, just about. And then, <laughs> um, yeah, it's sort of like Charlie Wilson's War is understanding once you what happens when you achieve it. What do you? What then happens? And most people fail to actually recognize. The, that that's part of the process. You've gotten to your goal. Now yeah. what? And there's going to be second, third, and fourth order consequences right. that yeah, can't predict. Ian, what's going on with you? Yeah, we're just excited to, to be here talking about real-time monitoring. That's for sure. Same. I have a question for you, Carthy. What is your best advice for first-time CEO? Well, I think the, the best advice I can give them is some advice that I got from Ben Horowitz when I started Signal Off X. Um, and, and Ben is a great, uh, great CEO coach and um, written some great books uh, with some fantastic advice for first time CEOs. What he told me was, you know, run to the run to the darkness, run to the pain, <laughs> because when you're starting a company, there's more stuff that's going to go wrong than there's going to go right. And you need to embrace uh, what is not going well. And there are always going to be things that are not going well. And your job as the CEO is always to focus on the most important of those and get it right and then move on to the next thing. And, you know, don't don't get phased by stuff going wrong. It happens and just make sure that you're you're chasing it down. So I think that's the best advice I got. And it's the advice I would pass on to anyone else. What question do you never get asked? that you wish you were asked more often? You know, I, I almost never get asked. I'm surprised by this as an entrepreneur. I almost never get asked if you know everything that you know now about doing it, would you do it again? And I would, but the advice I give people is that you have to start a company for the right reasons. You know, if, if you're doing it because you believe in the mission, uh, if you want the character development of pushing yourself and and seeing how, how you know, how deep you can dig, then it's a phenomenal life experience. And it's one that I would encourage anyone to do. Um, but if you're doing it because you think you're going to get rich or whatever, then you're bound to be disappointed at some point along the journey and give up. Right. And then you'll wish you never did it because there are probably easier ways of, of making money somewhere else. Right. Um, so it, it just depends on the motivation, but uh, you know, so no one, no one ever asked me that. You've talked in the past about this idea of how supply chain is now becoming your digital supply chain. What was kind of your thought on why you think this is important for, for companies as we get into your 2020 and beyond? Every business has a supply chain of some sort or the other, right? And supply chains traditionally were physical supply chains, right? Like, um, um, and you have systems like SAP that are managing your entire, you know, um, supply chain and, and inventory and parts and availability and so on and so forth. In the digital world, more and more of the supply chain is um, being exposed through APIs, right? So mm -hmm. it's more and more automated. Um, you know, payments, you know, you can call an API from Stripe. Um, you know, even uh, stock exchanges are becoming fully digital, right? And they're automated and they're basically API calls between, um, you know, different uh, different parties. Um, you have companies that uh, are more and more, um, you know, instead of taking phone calls and, and uh, issuing parts, they're exposing an API to their upstream vendors to make calls and query how much inventory is available and, you know, purchase a part and then feed it into, you know, their, their upstream system. So everything is basically now API enabled. Um, and the challenge is you don't really have control over all of this uh, as a vendor. So one example, you know, we're dealing with a media company that had uh, uh, an event it was a big uh, you know um, anniversary show and when they were streaming their event uh, a small percent of their you know that you would load an ad in before someone could actually view the actual content and one of the ad vendors was just failing and the api calls were failing and what that the impact that had is on an end user you're trying to load this feed but you're not able to 
and people were getting on Twitter and cursing them out and it was really detrimental to the brand, but it wasn't really technically their fault, right? They had a third party vendor that they were, you know, making an API call out to, to load an ad and it was failing. And I think that's an example of the digital supply chain being broken. Um, you know, you could have a similar situation where you have a shopping cart and, you know, you're about to check out and you're making a call out to a third party payment provider. And if that API fails and, you know, your end user experience is, uh, is affected. Um, there are any hundreds or thousands of these that could happen, you know, if you're uh, calling out to a location based service to get someone's location and, and that fails and, you know, your app experience might fail. And so it's just this complex interdependent web now if you're trying to create a digital experience you've got a digital supply chain that you need to manage just like car companies had to manage their physical supply chains um, but there hasn't been enough attention to how do i make sure i get the quality of service i need from all of my downstream and upstream ecosystem partners uh, and that's something that more and more people now have to pay attention to because they're on the hook for the entire digital experience for their customers so what does that require? It requires having data, right? You got to collect data about every call that you're making. Are you getting the performance that you expected? Are you getting the error rates, any error rates, being able to hold all of your vendors accountable for that, drive better you know, accountability. Um, and that is a, sort of a big, largely untapped problem that you know most people don't have the sophistication to do that well yet. And that's the kind of thing that you can do with SignalFX very well, because if you're collecting the data, you feed it into SignalFX, again, you, you get real-time insight that, you know, everyone's going to have errors once in a while, but is there an unusually high error rate for this particular vendor? And uh, I want to shut them off and switch to a different supply, uh, you know, different vendor um, so that I can create a better experience for my end users. You know, that's, that's now critical to running a digital business. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And you think about, you know, how, uh, Ford became one of the biggest companies in the world. And they, you know, during World War II, they're cranking out like, you know, a however many planes a day and all the parts that go into that. Or you think about, you know, supermarkets or, you know, the Walmarts of the world that optimize every piece of shelf on, you know, their entire store exactly for certain things. So many people, so many of those supply chain, you know, logisticians, you know, from the military and all these different places. That was just so critical to being a company in the 80s. Like, you had to have just rock solid operators on that. And now those folks are your CIO, they might be your CTO, they might be your DevOps people. You know, we don't even know who those people necessarily are who control that. I, I love that idea of a digital supply chain. So I think you've got a meeting to run to in a little bit. Uh, this is a great place to end this interview. I have to do round two. This is awesome. Thanks so much for making the Thank time. Thank you, Chad. Appreciate it. Mission Daily and all of our podcasts are created with love by our team at mission.org. We own and operate a network of podcasts and a brand and story studio designed to accelerate learning. Our clients include companies like Salesforce, they're a customer times five, Twilio, and Katera who work with us because we produce results. To learn more and get our case studies, check out mission.org slash studios. If you're tired of media and news that promotes fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and if you want an antidote to all that chaos, you're at the right place. Subscribe here and to our daily newsletter at mission.org. Each morning, you'll get a newsletter that will help you start your morning and your day off right.